Welcome to the Greater Phoenix Economic Council's CHIPS Act webinar. This is an ongoing series of CHIPS Act webinars to help you and your organization leverage this federal program. As part of the CHIPS and Science Act, the Department of Commerce is overseeing 50 billion to revitalize the U.S. semiconductor industry, including 39 billion in semiconductor incentives. Since the first notification release on 28th of February, the Department of Commerce has continued to release more updates, including the pre-application and application instructions, guidebooks, and other resources for the first CHIPS for America funding opportunity for leading edge, current generation, mature node, and back-end semiconductor fabrication facilities. In addition, the department has posted on chips.gov the pre-application materials for all applicants and full application materials for applicants seeking incentives for leading edge facilities. Today's webcast will cover the recent second notification of funding opportunities, NOFO number two, for the construction, expansion, or modernization of commercial facilities for semiconductor materials and manufacturing equipment facilities for which the capital investment equals or exceeds 300 million. Thank you to our online viewers for taking the time to watch this webinar. My name is Sean Fogarty and I'm the Vice President of International Business Development for the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. A little housekeeping first, today's webinar will run, run for approximately one hour. I need to highlight our disclaimer. The information provided on this webinar does not constitute legal advice. Instead, all information, content, and materials available on this webinar and website are for general informational purposes only. Viewers of this webinar should contact their attorney or qualified service providers to obtain advice with respect to CHIPS Act funding and applications. Feel free to contact GPAC and we'll be happy to connect you with qualified professionals. The views expressed are those of the individual speakers in their individual capacities only. All, li all liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this webinar are hereby expressly disclaimed. The content is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. Lastly, I encourage you to sign up on the GPEC CHIPS Act resource page to receive updates. Our presenters today are Michael Patterson, Brett Johnson, and Troy Galan. Our first speaker is Mike Patterson, a partner with Spencer Fain, a firm of 425 attorneys in 22 US cities. He helps businesses navigate corporate compliance, securities, and transactional matters. He has extensive experience in domestic and international mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, distribution, licensing matters, and market entry strategies. He has recently been working with his team to help multiple companies in the semiconductor industry and its supply chain, whether on chips compliance, leasing, construction, corporate structuring, technology licensing, workforce, and employment, and other issues. Mike, take it away. Hi, I'm Mike Patterson, and I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Heather Hughes, who helped me put this together. She's listening in. Uh, chips Act, no phone number two. It is the title on it when it came out June 23rd was a notice of funding op opportunity uh, and it talked about expanding uh, the existing app uh, notice of funding opportunity that was out there. So uh, some debate on whether this is an expansion of NOFO 1 or NOFO 2, uh, my colleagues in uh, DC are saying, uh, everybody's saying NOFO number two, so I, I went with that. Okay, as of June 23rd, the scope of the current funding announcement has been expanded. Uh, we were greatly anticipating this beyond the leading edge uh, and the first group of four uh, uh, categories to the long awaited uh, uh, supply chain, which is uh, construction, expansion, or modernization of commercial facilities for semiconductor materials and manufacturing equipment facilities for the keyword there, equipment in the second part, for which the capital investment equals or exceeds 300 million. Next slide. The, just a quick review, next slide, of where we're at on the chips in case this is your first seminar you're where, with us. The, the overall program objectives are to strengthen the supply chain, security resilience, get this back from China, 
uh, where we were a lot of feeling bipartisan. The reason this went through so strongly is there was a feel that um, the U.S. had fallen behind and that uh, we, we had lost a lot of the strength of the semiconductor industry uh, uh, in, in Asia and we particularly in China. Uh, and we wanted to provide a supply of secure semiconductors here for our national security, strengthen our leadership in that, support job creation in this area, grow the economy, um, have a bolster skilled technical workforce in semiconductor here in the US, uh, include uh, economically disadvantaged individuals, small businesses, and then uh, improve our resilience in our supply chain, key to this NOFO number two. Next slide. Um, the first steps, what do you do if you want to be involved in this in any way, shape, or form? Number one, since February, anybody, regardless of phase, whether you're a big uh, leading edge manufacturer or whether you're going to be in the research and development that's coming in the fall, or whether you're in uh, the, the supply chain right now, which has been opened up, doesn't matter. Everyone can load up a statement of interest uh, with chips.gov, and uh, you also will register with SAM, uh, System for Award Management. M many of you already are uh, from what your, your defense industry work. Uh, and then once you do that, you would do a pre-application at the appropriate moment. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, when the time comes and you're, uh, uh, let's go to the next slide. When the time comes, you would do a full application. And I'm gonna show you the dates in just a second. You should not be filed until you receive your feedback on your pre-application. And then uh, what would happen after that? Let's say we're just going to, hopefully you're going to be successful and the government will pick you and your project and you'll get a preliminary memorandum of terms. Next slide. And that's non-binding. Then they'll do due diligence and then there will be an award preparation based on milestones and money will come out in tranches, et cetera. Next slide, please. Key dates. This all started with the first announcement back in February 28th after the, the act was done before that, but the first announcement with the regs and, regs and the funding and allowed anyone could do a statement of interest. Key rule there, you have to do your statement of interest at least 21 days before you submit any pre-application or full application. In March 31, pre-apps and full apps for, were for the uh, for the big uh, leading edge projects. And then May for current generation, mature node backend manufacturers. June, uh, the full application for the current generation, mature node backend manufacturer. None of this is new. Next slide. What is new is this NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity, beginning on September 1, uh, a little over a month from now, uh, uh, I'm sorry, two months from now, uh, on a rolling basis, pre-applications may be submitted for semiconductor materials and manufacturing equipment facilities, subject of this NOFO too, but for which capital investment equals or exceeds 300 million. That, we'll talk about that in great detail in a moment. Uh, and on uh, October 23rd, full applications can be submitted. So those are the two key dates for anyone in this category wanting to submit September the 1st, but you've got to get your statement of interest in now so you're not, so you're 21 days out. And then they mentioned in this NOFO again, uh, at a later date, fall 2023 or end of the summer, who knows, later, uh, they're going to, they mentioned they will be doing opening the door for semiconductor man materials, manufacturing equipment facilities, under 300 million, as well as research and development facilities for research and development. Uh, my note, it's not required, but they have mentioned over and over, and Brett and uh, Troy are going to mention this as well, consider joint applications, being a part of consortiums, et cetera. Next slide. Eligibility for NOFO2, that's the part I'm going to go through, and that is commercial facilities for materials 
used to manufacture semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing equipment, provided that the capital equals or exceeds 300 million. We're gonna go through the words on that. What does it mean? The first one, semiconductor materials facilities for the manufacture production, including growth or extraction. Look at that. Could that mean rare earth minerals? I think so. Of materials used to manufacture semiconductors, which are the chemicals, gases, raw and intermediate materials and other consumables used in semiconductor manufacturing. Specific examples they give, uh, uh, polysilicon, photoresist, ancillaries. I'm gonna give you just a second to look at this. Strippers, litho and solvents, anti-reflective and hard, hard mass layers, sputter targets, uh, tantalum, titanium and aluminum, and materials specifically used in quantum information systems, hafnium and niobium. Uh, construction, expansion, or modernization of these, as long as they're eligible, if they're uh, uh, as defined, the capital investment over equal or exceeds 300 million. Next slide. So that one was uh, materials. This one is the other part of the definition that's open, and that is equip manufacturing equipment facilities for the physical production of specialized equipment integral to the manufacturing of semiconductors and subsystems that are that enable or incorporated into the manufacturing equipment. Let me stop right there. One of the facts, ask a question, and this applied to a couple of my clients. What if my equipment, uh, whether it's ovens or if it's, uh, you know, oxidation furnaces or if it's uh, another piece of high-tech equipment can be used not only for semiconductor manufacturing, but could be used for other industries as well and support other industries. Is that a problem if we uh, if we make other things using this equipment that is that we're providing and we sell this to others? And the fact said, no problem. Go ahead as long as it can be used for the semiconductor piece. Uh, it, it's it's applicable. So uh, some specific examples are uh, deposition equipment, chemical vapor, uh, physical vapor, atomic layer, etching, wet etch, dry etch, lithography, stepper, scanners, extreme ultraviolet, wafer slicing, dicing, uh, wire bonders. Uh, look at all the things that could be included, all the components, and uh, uh, electron microscopes. Uh, optical inspection systems, et cetera, uh, ion implantation, uh, et cetera. Again, as long as the capital investment is defined in the section that we're going to examine in, a, in just a moment, equals or exceeds 300 million. Next slide. Let me just go back through. They restated their priorities and underscored them in this NOFO number two. Um, uh, I'm just going to fly low over these because uh, Brett and Troy are going to hit some of these uh, priorities again as well. Reducing vulnerabilities associated with geographic concentration, supply chain bottlenecks, particularly production in foreign countries of concern. So if you're if you're producing a gas or uh, isopropyl alcohol or uh, phosphorus material that is used in uh, uh, semiconductor production that is only currently available in Taiwan or in China or in getting it, getting it over here, that's huge priority. Look at the next one, clustering, building productive self-sustaining semiconductor ecosystems. They want you to cluster and it, it is a plus to be clustering with other facilities. I'm so proud that we're part of the greater Phoenix area where we have one of the clearly identified clusters in the nation, improving competitiveness and innovation, et cetera, in the ecosystem. The extent to which you're locating critical manufacturing in the United States. Uh, so again, if there's something that you're doing or going to create in the manufacturing and materials equipment of, uh, of space, next slide please, that is only currently available uh, offshore, they're gonna be thrilled to know that is a big point. Next slide, uh, let's see, hold on. Uh, you, you have to be a covered entity. This is out of NOFO 1, but repeat it again. But that could be one private entity or it could be a consortia of private and public entities. Um, that, but 
the main deal is you've got to show that you can get her done, that you can substantially finance, construct, expand, or modernize an eligible facility. They want to incentivize this investment in facilities and equipment in the U.S. And you need to show that this would not occur without the CHIPS financing. Without CHIPS financing, you wouldn't you wouldn't be doubling your size. You wouldn't be uh, expanding to this new line that is fantastic, okay? Projects that involve relocating a material amount of facilities um, to another facility, new or expanded, alone are disfavored. So if you're in Boston and you're just relocating it to Phoenix, that alone is gonna be disfavored. Absent, uh, you articulate a strong reason uh, let's think about strong rings. I think one strong reason would be clustering. Another would be uh, labor force availability, I think might be a possibility. Another one would be the, uh, the, um, that you're going to be able to work with a dis disadvantaged group. Next slide, please. Uh, you must have a documented interest in uh, mo uh, constructing, expanding, modernizing an, an eligible facility. And that one of the proofs of that is that you've got a covered incentive from a state or local jurisdiction uh, in, in Arizona, that would be the Arizona Commerce Authority or some uh, local uh, uh, development like a municipal. Uh, Brett will address this in a moment, how you go and get that. Uh, you need to show a commitment to worker and community investment and opportunities for eco economically disadvantaged people, training, education, et cetera. Uh, you want commitments from higher education. I would say having university supporting letters that fall in dovetail with the Commerce Authority uh, incentive that showing they're in support would be a strong positive uh, and also providing workforce training and having an executable plan uh, next next slide that includes workforce needs, but also shows the type of technology you're going to produce. Uh, and you'll see in the requirements we covered in the last one a little over a month ago for your pre-app that they want to know exactly how many units uh, per day, per month, per week, et cetera, in, as comparison. If you're expanding a facility and you're currently doing uh, a thousand widgets a day and you're going to be doing 2000. They want to see how you get there and why is that? Is there a market for that in the semiconductor uh, 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 space? Uh, your executable plan uh, must show that you've you've got combat. You're combating cloning, counterfeiting and relabeling of semiconductors uh, in the industry. No notes. Next slide. I wanted to show, I went to the disadvantaged individuals since, you know, some people say, oh, this is really highly uh, political type of thing. Not necessarily look at this long list. There are some, there are some key things all, and even some surprises in this list. Uh, for me, limited English proficiency or people that have been subjected to racial, ethnic or cultural bias. I think there's a lot that you can can be done with this. Uh, and look down uh, at the at the bottom here. Even individuals without a college degree is a key one. Uh, in the Greater Phoenix area, uh, we have over a dozen. We have the largest um, a community college system in the United States here in Greater Phoenix, and particularly in Arizona. Other community colleges around. There's over 150,000 students that could be updated by Sean here, uh, probably bigger number than that, but a huge amount of people without a college degree, but who have had some training. I think that's something uh, to tout when you get to a pre-app stage. Next slide. Uh, how is the 300 million calculated? It's uh, all out of this section 4.1.7. And there is a specific defined term, capital investment, that are the costs required to complete construction of the project and initiate operation. That's going to include specifically your land cost. And it, it uh, obviously that would include purchase, but I think that would include long-term leasing as well. Uh, construction, uh, labor and material, equipment, infrastructure improvements. This is key. Are you having to build utility plants for electricity or water? 
access to infrastructure uh, that is close by where you're going to have to spend significant monies on that wastewater treatment plants and administrative expenses directly attributable to the project construction, including your legal, your in engineering and permitting fees. Now, this I looked for this. It, it was not in the list on this specific section 4.1.7 that is cited, but because they made so much noise about workforce development and you must show an executable plan for it uh, or in your executable plan, I, I would strongly encourage you to show if you're going to spend some serious dollars on workforce development, I would think you should kick out that number and highlight it in your plan as well, uh, because this is a priority for them. And so I would like to see you add that. Next slide. Final thoughts uh, before we uh, go to uh, Brett and Troy. Statement of interest. Can I say it one more time? When should you do that? Now, if you haven't already done it, this 21 day rule, you're gonna come up against your competitors getting their pre-apps in. Uh, get your statement of interest in. One client asked me, if we put this in and we later decide we don't wanna do a pre-application, we don't wanna go further, should we do it? I said, absolutely. Uh, Chips.gov wants to know who's out there. Uh, if, if you're the only one in the country doing X and you don't put in a, a pre-app, you might get a call. They, they say, hey, we want you to apply. Uh, should you join with others? Uh, Brett's going to, Brett and, and Troy are going to talk more about that. Uh, there were multiple comments in this uh, NOFO 2 about uh, uh, doing exactly that. It's not a requirement. It is a plus. First news, though, I wanted to say about uh, six weeks ago, uh, Chips.gov released that only 300 statement of interest had been filed at that point. I was shocked. I thought with uh, $39 billion on the table, uh, you know, with overall 50 billion, that's a lot of money. And only 300 people in the country filed something. So if you're on this call and you're on the, and you're on the border, do it, file, file a statement of interest. And uh, last but not least, those of you who are not gonna be able to file, but maybe you're a contractor or a service provider or something, hey, there's a lot of trickle down that's gonna come off of this money. And uh, particularly our region should get a chunk of it. And uh, I think it's, it's great for it, go for it. Get, let's get those SOIs in and then you can support the people that are doing the statements of interest and the pre-apps. They have parts in their outline that they need to file with the government that include your contracting information. And so you are still an integral part. Uh, next slide. Here's some key links, chips.gov, and then the, the first NOFO, the application portal itself, and frequently asked question, wealth of information. Last slide for me, please. Next slide. And that's me, Heather, and Sean at GPEC. And then I turn it over to our uh, Brett Johnson and Troy, uh, who have a dynamite presentation coming. Thank you, Mike, for that very insightful presentation. And our next speakers are Troy Gallant and Brett Johnson. So speaking first will be Troy Gallant, an associate with Snell and Wilmer, where he represents publicly and privately held companies, as well as government agencies analyzing international trade and sanctions compliance activity, including risk, assess risk assessments, due diligence, export licensing, import duties, and potential violations. Troy? Thanks, John. Next slide, please. So what Brett and I will be talking about is the vision for success. This is a document that was released along with the second or the expanded NOFO. And what does this document do? It articulates the and the objectives for the supply chain funding. These are soft requirements. These are in addition to the substantive requirements that Mike uh, just talked to you about. These requirements are uh, themes that applicants want to um, have and show to the department through their applications, but they're not specific requirements. This vision for success applies to the NOFO expansion or the NOFO number two, but will also apply to the upcoming NOFO that we're expecting in the fall 2023. I do wanna clarify though, that the, uh, the application requirements for the fall NOFO are expected to be different 
even though the vision and objectives that we will discuss today will be the same. Next slide, please. So some big distinctions between the first NOFL and the second or expanded NOFL. The first NOFL was concentrating on fabrication facilities. And as we know, this expanded NOFL is for semiconductor materials and manufacturing equipment suppliers. Some of the biggest distinctions are that the first NOFL was intended for manufacturing investment. And the expanded NOFL, even though as we will discuss, also applies for domestic suppliers, is highly targeted to those applicants that are unwilling or unable to move to the United States, meaning foreign companies. Um, again, the first NOFL was primarily geared to applicants in the United States, while these expanded NOFL encourages and welcomes non-US applicants. One thing to note is that a, as a sub-requirement, the department is unlikely to grant funding for those suppliers that are going to be moving to the United States organically, meaning that if a big semiconductor manufacturer will move to the United States and you will move your facilities here or your part of your supply chain as part of that um, new, new facility in the United States, you're unlikely to get separate funding from that. Next slide, please. This is one of the items that we will discuss the strengthening the supply chain here. What is the overview here? What the department is trying to do is reduce the choke point for race flowing from geographic concentrations. As Mike mentioned, this will be targeted funding. That means there will be a heightened standard to qualify and the department will be more selective with the applicants that it ultimately grants funding to. What the department is looking for is applicants that are located in the Asia Pacific region or other regions that are subject to geopolitical instability. The vision for success specifically referenced Ukraine as an area where there is no semiconductor manufacturing. However, a lot of the supplies and suppliers for the semiconductor industry are located in that region of the world. Of note, this expanded NOFO is not seeking a self-sufficient semiconductor supply chain. Um, that was one of the requirements for the first NOFO. Here instead, the NOFO is looking for investments that will also involve not leading your suppliers. So for, what, is, what does that mean exactly? That means that if you have a facility somewhere abroad and you're planning on bringing only part of your operations to the United States, maybe only part of your manufacturing activity, that would be that would be okay. You're not required to move the entire facility, the entire production for a specific supply back to the United States. Uh, one of the items that they will be looking for is uh, funding for increased domestic production versus new production. Again, the department sees that opening a brand new facility as opposed to expanding a facility or expanding existing operations is a better use of these funds. Next slide. One of the items that the department will be looking at is coordination with other US agencies. Um, for applicants, one of the items that they want to ensure before they submit a pre-application or go ahead and submit a full application is whether there's other type of funding available. Um, as my mate, Mike mentioned, we know that a lot of applicants are able to serve not only the semiconductor industry, but also other parts of our supply chain or other parts or the industries as well. So if you're subject to funding that could qualify under the DOD, the Department of Defense, or the Department of Energy, and you're likely to qualify, that may be another, a better option than applying directly under the TIPS Act. Again, um, since they're not looking to create a self-sustaining ecosystem in the United States, um, applicants that are in those areas where the U.S. does not have a concern, such as Canada, Australia, and somewhere in the European Union, Japan, that is, they're not likely to get funding um, subject to some additional, additional facts that we will discuss momentarily. And if you fall under any of these categories and you still want to apply for CHIPS funding, as we mentioned before, one of the alternatives is to consider applying as a consortium, and Brent will, Brent will provide us with more details um, for that. Next slide, please. Increased transparency. The vision for success notes that the U.S. government through the Department of Commerce is seeking to outline and map all the, all the suppliers for, semicon for semiconductors that are key to national security. As you may remember, the first NOFO required applicants to list their suppliers, and under the second or expanded NOFO, applicants should expect to provide detailed information on their customers. Something that several of our clients have asked is, 
uh, if they're com they're not they're not comfortable disclosing this kind of confidential information, but we remind you that there's specific ways of noting that this information is confidential and it will not be publicly disclosed. Um, it's important to note there are some very specific requirements listed on the NOFO of how to note confidential information. So to the extent that you're submitting this type of information, make sure that you do follow those requirements as closely as possible. Some additional areas that applicants should consider is sharing information with other players in the industry, especially if you are able to supply not only the semiconductor industry, but other industries. Um, have that communication and try to identify any risk of shortage for the specific supply that you're able to provide and make sure that is highlighted in your application. Again, when you do go ahead and apply, uh, consider any overlap with the application of uh, primary applicants under the first NOFO. It is likely that some of those companies that you provide supplies to have listed you as a key, uh, key supply. And if you mark that information in your application, that will also go a long way to notice that funding may be split in a way or not necessarily be distributed the way the department um, the department intends. Um, of note, the cheap stack funding on this expanded NOFO is not intended to address shortage risk. What does that mean? That means that if there's a specific problem, the department is unlikely to fund it if there are other supplies out there that can mitigate that risk. And the one exception will be is, as Mike mentioned, if there's only one supplier for one specific country, the department may consider an exception for that, but that would only be for rare cases that funding would actually be approved. Next slide, please. Advancing US technology leadership. This is the second aspect that the vision for success will discuss. And the NOFL vision for success is separated under domestic suppliers and some foreign suppliers. For domestic suppliers, what is this NOFL looking for? They're looking to support and, ex and expand facilities that already exist. Again, this is a sub requirement that does not mean there's no funding available for brand new facilities. Here, we listed some of the type of supplies that the Department of Commerce considers to be um, very important for the semiconductor supply chain. But again, this is not, not an inclusive list. All the suppliers can also qualify for funding. And again, if you are a supplier to a supplier, you can also apply for funding under this expanded NOFO if you provide some of the equipment for the positions for chemical um, planarization, you're also able to apply as a main applicant under this expanded NOFO. And what is the main thing the department will be looking for for domestic suppliers? They want to see collaboration between the suppliers and chip makers. So what does that mean? That applies particularly to the advanced equipment manufacturers. If you're developing or manufacturing a specific type of equipment that can be used in semiconductors, they want to know that you're testing it in collaboration with a a customer, a specific uh, semiconductor manufacturing that you're taking their feedback and that any concerns that they may have on other items such as supplies that you're taking into consideration and that you're going and acting um, to mitigate those risks. And that is something that they will be very likely and very eager to provide um, funding for to create these symbiotic relationships between supplier applicants and chip makers. Next slide, please. For non-U.S. suppliers, um, this is a very important point. They are looking for first-timers, people and applicants that do not have a facility already in the United States. If you are a foreign applicant that already has a presence in the U.S., you are more likely to fall under the domestic uh, category that we just discussed. So those foreign applicants that are coming to the United States for the first time, what do they need to show um, to prioritize their application? First, they need to demonstrate they will contribute to the innovation ecosystem in the United States. The department wants to see that applicants will bring capabilities that are not currently in the United States uh, present or that are just not as advanced as in other countries. And of course, as part of that process, they want you to import your know-how and any technologies that are necessary to develop that specific supply or that specific machinery that I use in the semiconductor technology. As well, um, as I mentioned earlier, engagement with U.S. allies is an important part of this vision for success. And this is the exception that I referenced before, where if you are located in one of those countries where the United States doesn't have a national security concern, um, U.S. allies, countries that are friendly to the United States, consider whether your application will diversify, diversify the supply chain. 
some of the some of the items that we've discovered through the first NOFO is that a lot of applicants only have one supplier for one item out of one country. And even though that country may be friendly to the United States, um, the lack of diversity will be something that will be considered. Um, in terms of workforce development, you have to be willing to recruit and hire US-based engineers. Again, we understand that uh, some applicants may require to bring some of their engineers from other countries. And of course, that will be part of bringing innovation to the United States. But again, the Department of Commerce will be looking for applicants that are willing to recruit engineers that were trained in the United States. Next slide, please. Supporting the fabrication cluster. Next one, please. This, this is the last and third item for the vision of success for the Department of Commerce. And I will pass it here to my colleague, Brett Johnson, to talk about it. Perfect. Thanks, Troy. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, Brett. If you yes. don't mind, I'll just very quickly give you an introduction. Okay. Thank you so much, Troy, for that great presentation. And our next speaker is Brett Johnson, a partner with Snell and Wilmer, where he represents businesses and individuals in government relations matters. His practice includes government regulatory compliance, export and import controls, government contracting and political law. Take it away, Brett. Perfect, thank you, Sean. Um, and what I'm gonna go over real quick is the concept of clusters. And I really wanna try to break that down and make sure everybody understands the concept of clusters. Some clusters occur organically or by coordination, but there's no affiliation between the clusters. They might be part of the supply chain, for example. Um, and that is one of the first issues is that what are state and local entities doing to support that organic um, cluster? Um, but in addition to that is the, the way that the new uh, vision has been set up. It also discusses more of a formal cluster where basically an organization or an entity um, can, be, can, uh, can come together, um, basically identify the gaps that the, the government has already identified and some of the things that have already been discussed by Mike and Troy, and, and really how is it going to be able to deal with it? It might be on a small business level or, or smaller scale than some of the larger um, projects that are being proposed, say by TSMC or by other entities. So I wanted, I wanted to start with that concept because what we have seen in other states is the, a more formal cluster where there was actually a, a formation agreement and then the cluster is actually incorporated and a project manager, manager is, is identified and hired and retained uh, to support the whole cluster and then the, the little pieces um, that the cluster would do would be um, um, separated out, or at least that's how the project um, is, is planned. So I would keep your eye out for more of those formal clusters, but obviously, obviously identifying the informal clusters that are, again, are natural or organic. And, and so it's kind of a mixed terminology there. But it really is important of those clusters, whether it's the, the organic and it's not a formalized group or actually a formalized cluster that's actually submitting an application itself, is to have that government, that local government involvement. And whether in here in Arizona, it's um, uh, more in the Arizona Commerce Authority, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But the, it has to show that there's actually incentives from these state and local entities um, for the suppliers. And it, it has to make sure that it's benefiting um, a wide set of firms and it can't just be targeted for one specific company. Basically, the incentives have to be open to everyone and then identified as such. Um, the, one of the main issues is, is um, streamlining the, the permitting. That's an, that's an easy one. So it, say in Scottsdale, where it takes maybe six months to get a permit or a license, is Scottsdale going to be working with uh, the company to, to shorten that, that permitting time? The other one is the building of critical infrastructure, i.e. roads or um, putting up electric electricity or other utilities in the area to support um, the, the cluster or even uh, the applicant's uh, um, project. And then finally, what, what, what is the state government or local government or even the community colleges doing to build a strong and di diverse uh, workforce? The, the letters of support that we've seen have actually really identified those from a state and, and local level, and maybe definitely should go forward. Um, again, as part of the consortium, 
should consider a targeted funding for certain areas to kind of develop that cluster. Um, obviously, making sure the supply chain is not all in one place because that's a main issue. But to the extent that we're able to replicate something that's not in the United States here, um, that's obviously very important. And they, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be by itself. It could be a tag along to an applicant who uh, qualified for the first NOFO, for example. Um, some of the examples that uh, that Commerce has put out is join a science park or regional one-stop shop that's established by um, an, an entity um, for this purpose. Um, again, there has to be a, a big um, open and continued dialogue with all of the applicants. The Department of Commerce is expecting it to be transparent with them. You can identify stuff that is confidential, of course, but you're going to have to really make sure um, that your applications are, are correct. Um, and finally, um, when you're submitting um, the statements of interest, identifying some of those items. Next slide, please. So here, in, next slide, please. Here in Arizona, it's the Arizona Commerce Authority. Other states have a different framework, but here Arizona Commerce Authority has primarily been um, the agency responsible for identifying CHIPS Act support. However, it can be the local, um, your, your local city or county that is providing. There's no requirement, even in the state of Arizona, that it's an Arizona Commerce Authority only. In fact, to the extent you have letters of support from a variety of different governmental agencies, it's only going to support your application. Um, and basically that it's gonna, it has to be an assertion that you qualify for the incentive. Doesn't necessarily have to be the development agreement or something um, specific, but a letter of intent or some other document where their analysis has been done and the state of Arizona in this case, and through the Arizona Commerce Authority says, if you do A, B, and C, you would be entitled to these incentives in support of the CHIPS Act, which I think is very important. The generic economic development letter that does not make reference to CHIPS Act is only going to diminish your application. So really encourage you to, uh, to ensure that the letters make reference to the CHIP Act. Um, and the other, again, as we mentioned before, it could also be constructed construction incentives, not just the permitting itself, but possibly maybe some tax relief, um, and then workforce related incentives, whether it be um, training for your workforce, identifying long term workforce demands. And again, the community colleges are, are actually taking a great lead on this. Next, please. So as part of the ACA process, um, I highly encourage you, they, they, they're they working like fiends over there and really have this down, but you do have to fill out a questionnaire. Um, again, because obviously a lot of these projects are hypothetical, you're identifying the best of your ability and that's okay. Um, but an ACA needs at least one week lead time to be able to review and, and provide the letter and deal with questions and answers. So making sure that you get ahead of that, especially before your pre-application, that would be great. You don't maybe necessarily need it for your statement of interest because you can just make reference to it, but definitely by your pre-application phase, you're going to want to have some of these things locked down so you can talk about that with the Department of Commerce during your hearing. Um, and one thing we've clarified, we've said on the previous presentations, we, we thought there was a requirement to be part of the task force for the ACA. Other states have their own uh, models that it's not a requirement for them, for the ACA to give you incentives that will support a CHIPS Act application. Next, please. So here is the, the, the a real quick slide that kind of shows you the information, the Excel spreadsheet. They want, they want to know about the site location for the real estate, key project dates or milestones, obvious, obviously sometimes an assumption, uh, metrics on utilities usage. They want to know uh, the number of employees. They want to know the salary and whether or not there's health benefits. And those are all tracked by statute. So you really want to make sure that you're giving information that is going to be qualified and then obviously meet those requirements. You can't say, hey, our salaries are going to be above what's required by the state of Arizona. And then once you get the money, have those decreased. Those are going to be all tracked by the milestones. So make sure you get this correct. They also want to know an estimate of the capital expenditures. Obviously, we've all been dealing with supply chain over the last several years. So that might be an issue. Um, but you're going to have to make sure you really give some really good information about uh, the capital expenditures and where those are going to be. Next slide, please. So here, th here are things to consider as we, as we, as we've read the, the most recent NOFO two, as Mike mentioned, um, but also from our experiences, learning from uh, those who have come before us. 
um, ensure that all of your incentives that are being sought match up on the information. So for example, if you're telling the Arizona Commerce Authority one thing, you should also be telling the CHIPS Act Department of Commerce the same thing. If you're applying for a foreign trade zone application as part of a larger economic incentive package, you're going to want to make sure that that information matches up to your CHIPS Act application. Um, as, as put out in the most recent guidance, um, potential leveraging of other federal government contract opportunities, funding opportunities, such as small business research grants, things of that nature, that is going to be encouraged, especially when you're saying that other agencies are in need of what you're proposing. Again, a team or the consortium approach, the team is just identifying basically your supply chain and showing maybe your construction company, your workforce development company, um, the, the, the association with the community colleges or the universities. That's more of a team approach and you're gonna do letters of, letters of support as part of your application. The more formal consortium approach is a little bit different and that's gonna to have to be structured if you wanna go down there. But I really think based off of what the Department of Commerce is looking at, they are gonna be looking for more of those formal consortiums while obviously still supporting the informal con uh, consortiums uh, through individual applications. Um, again, ensuring that the letters of support and commitment, whether it's from the, the community college or from the city, that they match up to the specific requirements of the CHIP Act, and making sure that the CHIPS Act is actually referenced in those letters. Um, the workforce development, one thing that we've learned is to the extent that, say, you have a construction company or you have a project development company, what are they going to be doing for workforce development to support the greater project, ca causing economies of scale or leveraging those experiences and those opportunities to make your application bigger. So you might be only a company with 20, 30 people, but your construction company might have hundreds of people who are going to be working on this project. How are you going to incorporate that those workforce development plans into your project? We've seen some really remarkable stuff put out by the larger construction companies in support of CHIPS Act, and it'd be great if the other supply or supply chain folks would do the same thing. Um, the other thing is, is that, hey, th these are government documents. You shouldn't be, uh, uh, lack of a better terms, lying or embellishing on them. Obviously, it's, this is also a marketing effort, so you want to make sure that your application is the best. But you're going to have to have these compliance programs for proper tracking, ensuring that the workforce development plan, for example, all of those training programs, those are in, in place before your application is submitted because the government is going to want to ensure that its money is being spent appropriately and what the application is for. That's not necessarily necessary for the pre-application stage, but definitely by the application phase. As Mike mentioned on the timely applications, um, we, we are surprised at how long it is taking companies or different groups to put together their applications and their plans to get out. Um, our recommendation has been on every single one of these seminars is to get it in early um, and be, up, be able to get that engagement with the Department of Commerce as soon as possible so your application is on top. Now, obviously, there's billions at stake, but eventually when some of the larger entities, TSMC, Intel, other entities that are going to be coming in, um, and, and really getting a lot of that money up front, um, that's, that's going to not leave that much mo money for other entities and supply chain. And so those who get their applications in first, I think, are going to have a better opportunity. The next issue, the last one, is patience. Um, uh, right now, the Department of Commerce is doing a great job, but this is a brand new program with a lot of moving parts, very complicated program, even for the federal government. So what we recommend is patience, patience on uploading, patience on gathering the data um, and ensuring you're putting your best foot forward. So with that, that's all I have. And uh, Sean, thank you for having us. Well, thank you, Brett, for such a detailed presentation. And now, um, as we wrap up, I would like to ask Mike, Brett, and Troy if you have any final remarks in our last 30 seconds on this uh, webinar. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one little point is a lot of people are waiting for other people to start the process, right, about that whole consortium, whether it be informal or formal. 
regardless of where you are in that supply chain or that you're just a supplier or a construction company, of, of starting that conversation and being the first one out, I think are going to put you in the better position. So just because you're not the manufacturer doesn't mean that, you, but you service um, the manufacturer, mm -hmm. or you service the industry, I think it's important for somebody to take a step forward on this. It's going to benefit everybody, especially your customer base. Um, Mike, I have a comment, but I can't seem to get the video back on, excuse me. Uh, the, but I will say uh, it is important, uh, these soft factors, uh, as uh, Troy mentioned them, and I covered some of the priorities and Brett has too, are really important. I think uh, if you have a, a distinctive that you're doing something that is, you're the only one, or this is not available in the United States, I think you need to weave in these key points. We're not just blowing smoke here when we talk about it's important that you show your relationship to the cluster. You show that you're a critical need for, uh, you know, for the industry, for its resilience, et cetera. I think it's uh, really important uh, that you uh, get some help if you need to, to weave those in and uh, do some good drafting uh, on this work. And I agree with Brett, don't wait and and be at the end and, and go get some feedback from them as quickly as possible. But I, I do believe, uh, uh, you know, put some en energy and effort into this and get some help and get some consultation. Well, thank you all. Hopefully this webinar will spark an interest among our viewers to learn more about CHIPS Act and how your company can apply for it. The Department of Commerce recently announced over 300 companies submitted their statement of interest. So it's gonna be very competitive. Again, we encourage all firms to engage with qualified professionals to assist you with the CHIPS Act funding opportunities and application. Please contact GPEC if you have any questions or need introductions to service providers. Uh, GPEC services are free of charge. I would like now to uh, acknowledge our MarCom team, Sermina and Logan, who have helped to create the GPEC CHIPS Act web resource page. If you haven't visited it, I would encourage you to check out our website and subscribe to our email list. It's regularly updated when there are new updates from the Department of Commerce and CHIPS program office. I also want to acknowledge our team on the engagement side who've uh, helped to coordinate and facilitate this. Thank you very much, Lindsay and Cora. And I also want to encourage you um, to check out the chips.gov website. They have a wonderful website with all of their updates. For companies that are planning to submit an application, GPEC can also provide an economic analysis so uh, economic impact analysis, so that can help you quantify the direct and indirect jobs impact of your project. Finally, thank you, Mike, Brett, and Troy for sharing your insights on the second NOFO. We appreciate the support from Spencer Fain and Snell and Wilmer. And we'd like to thank all of our viewers uh, for viewing this webinar. We hope you find the discussion informative and valuable. This concludes our program.